Welcome to Orbital Dynamics Part 24. Here I'm going to talk about rotation and angular momentum. So far I've talked about forces that result in motion. You can apply these forces in a number of ways. Non-rigid elements such as ropes, wires, cables, or chains can pull, but they can't push. The pull of a rope on an object is directed along its length, and thus a force is imparted along this length. By Newton's third law, the object pulls back on the rope with an equal and opposite force, putting the rope under tension. The tension transmits the force to the other end of the rope. A rigid element, such as a rod or a beam, can either pull or push. By Newton's third law, the object pulls or pushes with an equal and opposite force, putting the rod under tension for a pull or compression for a push. While tension in a rope is directed along its length, a rigid rod rod can support transverse forces. For example, a thick plank crossing a ditch horizontally must be supported by transverse upward forces to hold up its weight. If the forces applied don't have an opposite transverse component, then it causes a rotation. Consider a seesaw. The tendency to rotate counterclockwise increases with the weight of the person on the left and with the distance from the pivot point. We call the tendency of a force to produce rotation torque. We define its magnitude as the product of the magnitude of the force and the perpendicular distance between its line of application and the axis of rotation. Note that I'm applying the force at right angles to the seat. This is what produces torque. Torque is commonly referred to with the Greek letter tau, and it's about an axis passing through point P. We're going to want to express torque as a vector. Lateral forces go along the line of velocity. Torque has to go in some other direction. The convention is for it to be normal to the plane of rotation, which means, according to the right-hand rule, if you see something rotating counterclockwise, then the torque is coming out at you. There isn't anything physical that comes out at you. This is just the way torque is accounted for as a vector. Torque is equal to the force vector F times the distance from the pivot point D. The force F is a vector, and if you multiply it by D, it's also a vector. The convention is to call counterclockwise torques positive and clockwise torques negative. Since torque is a function of the force and the length of the lever arm D, a force of 3 newtons applied at the end of a 2 meter lever arm exerts the same torque as a force of 1 newton applied at the end of a 6 meter lever arm. The units of torque are newton meters or, in imperial units, foot pounds. In the seesaw case, equilibrium requires the counterclockwise torque exerted by the person on the left to be balanced by the clockwise torque exerted by the person on the right. Tau equals F1 times D1 plus F2 times D2. The forces F1 and F2 counteract each other. If D1 equals D2, then the forces have to be equal in magnitude to cancel out. If D1 is less than D2, then F1 has to be greater than F2 for the forces to cancel out. Here, I've subtracted F2 times D2. What if the force is not exerted orthogonally to the vector R? Link of this diagram on the right, you can think of the length D as the lever arm. The torque about P is the force F times D. I'd want to express it in terms of R, the distance from the axis of rotation at P to the point of application of the force. Theta is the angle defined by R and the dotted line. D equals R sine theta, hence the torque is equal to the vector F times R sine theta. What this means is that the force F, even though it's acting on a movement arm of, even though it's acting on a on a segment of length r is only applying torque of d times f or r sine theta times f. It's as if the force f were acting on the moment arm d. The point here is that only orthogonal forces create torque. Archimedes was the first to talk about the concept of torque. It originated with his study of levers. So here's what torque looks like. If I have an instantaneous force and I apply it to a rod, it will rotate at a constant rotation rate. And so the only torque that was applied was at the beginning of the video. Um, after the torque was applied, the rod rotated freely. 
Here's a case where there's constant torque. In that case, rotation starts and increases over time. So if I apply a constant torque, I'm applying a constant force, which will increase the rotational velocity. Here I want to show you what a normal vector looks like. This is a SketchUp, which is originally made by Google and is available on the web. So here I've created a plane. This is the plane of rotation. And I'll label it as such. And I want to draw a line. This will be the position vector. And the position of the object will be here. And then this will be the force vector. And I'll label that force. And this will be the pivot point. So the force will cause a rotation of the object at the position along the pivot point. And then here, I'm drawing a vector that comes out of the plane. And it's at right angles to the plane. So it's, we call that being normal to the plane. And this is the torque vector. And it's normal to the plane. This is also the direction that the um, angular momentum vector goes. And then if I rotate this around, you can see that the normal vector points out of the plane. And the position vector and the force vector actually define the plane of rotation. As I said, the torque is F times R sine theta, where theta is the interior angle formed by R and F. Mathematically, the right side of this equation is the magnitude of the vector cross product of R cross F. The vector form of torque is R cross F. And as I showed you, in the previous video, torque or tau is normal to the plane of rotation for R. In fact, it's the axis of rotation. And in this diagram, it will be coming out of the page. Since forces are not perfectly orthogonal, um, I can break the net force into a perpendicular and lateral or parallel component. This is the symbol for the perpendicular component of force. The magnitude of the perpendicular component of force is the magnitude of the force times sine theta. This is the symbol for the parallel component of force. The magnitude of the parallel component of force is the magnitude of the force times the cosine of theta. The perpendicular component of torque results in rotation. The parallel component results in straight line motion or velocity. I've shown the vector forms of these equations. The scalar forms look like this. The equations are equivalent to the first two. You'll note that the vectors are within brackets. That means they're scalar values. I want to diagram this in three dimensions. Here's the plane of rotation. Newton's first law suggests that any object in motion will continue in straight line motion unless acted upon by a force. The analog for torque is any object that's rotating will continue its rotation in a plane unless acted upon by a torque. The pivot point P is here. This is the position vector R that's in the plane of rotation. The force is applied at the tip of R, and I'll call that point Q. Here's the force vector, and it is also on the plane of rotation. In fact, F and R define the plane of rotation. And the axis of rotation is P. In this diagram, I picked that arbitrarily. In the next slide, I'll show you where the actual axis of rotation would be um, for a real object. This is the cross product of R and F. It's orthogonal to both F and R, and hence is normal to the plane of rotation. And this forms the vector tau. If f were parallel to r, then r cross f would equal 0, because r sine theta is 0, and the sine of 0 is 0. A force applied this way will not cause any rotation. A force applied in this direction will only cause straight line motion.
Look at the diagram on the left again. The torque results from the component of force is perpendicular to the line or vector from the pivot point to the object. Now I want to talk about two objects. If the origin or pivot point is here, the I unit vector is here, recall that runs along the X axis. The J unit vector is here, recall that runs along the Y axis. The K unit vector is here and runs along the Z axis and is coming straight out at you. I'll use this notation to depict that. Think of this as an arrow whose head is pointing straight at you. If Z were going the other way, you'd see the feathers and it would look like this. I'll put R1 here and R2 here. Now I'm going to show positive and negative torques. F1 exerts a clockwise torque, so its torque is negative. Tau thus points against the z-axis and is aligned with the origin. That is the axis of rotation. F2 exerts a counterclockwise torque. Its torque is positive. Tau points with the z-axis at the point O, the axis of rotation. And this conforms the right-hand convention for coordinate systems. Since F1 exerts a clockwise torque about the z-axis passing through O, its torque is negative. In this example, the sine of tau2 is positive and tau1 is negative because the direction of R2 is reversed from R1. If vectors R1 and R2 were defined as a single rigid body like a rod or a beam, then the point of rotation, which in this example is at the point O, would be the center of mass. This assumes the rod is in free space. If it's attached to something at a single point, that would tend to be the the pivot point, and the rotation would be around that pivot point. That's the seesaw example. If this were a rigid rod, it would be balanced if all torques and, and forces sum to zero. This is called equilibrium. This example was in the xy plane with torques along the z-axis. If you have equilibrium in three dimensions, then you have to have equilibrium in each dimension. The sum of f sub x equaling 0 means there is no acceleration along the x-axis. The sum of f sub y equaling 0 means there's no acceleration along the y-axis. And tau z being 0 means there's no rotation about the z-axis. And if all these conditions are met, there is equilibrium overall. I can express this generally as the sum of all forces being 0 and the sum of all torques being 0. In three dimensions, the sum of all torques must equal 0 about all points, not just O as in our example. If the sum of all taus around one point vanishes, and if the sum of all forces is equal to zero, then tau vanishes at all points. I'll depict the sum of all forces as the sum of all f sub i, and let's have it equal to zero. The total torque tau around a specific axis would equal the cross product of r sub i and f sub i, and it equals zero. Now let's consider the torque around the second axis. I'll displace r sub i by r sub zero. I can express that as the sum of r sub i cross f plus r sub 0 cross the sum of f sub i. The first summa summation equals tau, which we said equals 0. I also said the second summation equals 0, hence tau prime equals 0, which is intuitively obvious. So if a body is at rest and is not rotating at a given point, then it can't be rotating at any other given point. So this video shows what it looks like when you have a downward force at the edge of a, end of a rod, and in some cases it causes torque, and in some cases it causes lateral motion. And it may not be intuitively obvious, but the velocity downward is increasing, and the torque oscillates like a pendulum. So in the real world, if you apply a force to the end of an object that's not constantly orthogonal, you would get this kind of motion. Objects in free space rotate around their center of mass. In part 20, I showed you a mathematical proof for why Newton was able to consider spheres of uniform density as point masses. The points were the center of mass. The center of mass for a symmetrical object like a sphere with a uniform density is the geometric center. Nothing, however, in the universe is perfectly symmetrical and nothing has uniform density. In a more complicated case, where objects aren't symmetric, like the diagram here, there are methods for determining the center of gravity. An empirical method is to suspend the object from an arbitrary point P and draw a vertical line through P. The center of gravity must lie somewhere along that line. Next, suspend the object from a second point, P prime, and draw a vertical through P prime. The center of gravity is at the intersection of the two lines. In orbital dynamics, we refer to the center of gravity.
There's an important but subtle difference between the center of gravity and the center of mass. The force of gravity diminishes by 1 over r squared, where r is the distance between centers. Gravity is stronger at the sides of the objects that are near each other and is weaker at the sides of the objects that are farthest away from each other. If the gravitational force were uniform, then the center of mass and the center of gravity would be the same. With gravity diminishing with 1 over r squared, however, the center of mass and the center of gravity can be different. In part 22, I talked about momentum being the integral of force. Analogous to that, angular momentum is the integral of torque. I said before that tau equals the cross product of the position vector r and the force vector f. Torque thus depends on the distance r from a chosen origin o to the point of application of the force f. Torque produces a rotation about the origin o. The vector r rotates in the direction of the force applied. Rotation occurs in a plane defined by the position vector r and the force vector f. For the right-hand rule, the torque vector tau is normal to the plane of rotation. The equation that characterizes Newton's second law is force f equals mass times acceleration. Acceleration is the change in velocity, hence f equals m dv dt. I can rearrange terms and express that as d dt mv. Mass times velocity is momentum, p. Force is then the change in momentum over the change in time, dp dt. Force thus equals d dt of the momentum vector p. This is the derivative form of force of the force vector f. I can substitute dp dt for f in the torque equation. The derivative form of force is the change in momentum, d dt of p. The derivative form of tau is also going to involve a change in momentum. This equation accomplishes that, but it isn't quite complete because it's a fixed because r is fixed and p is changing. What I really want to evaluate is the derivative of r cross p, the torque. The cross product rule for derivatives says that the derivative of r cross p equals dr dt cross p plus r cross dp dt. I'll subtract dr dt cross p from both sides. I get that d dt r cross p minus dr dt cross p equals r cross dp dt. The right-hand side of this equation, r cross dp dt equals tau. I can thus substitute the left-hand side of this equation for r cross dp dt in the equation for tau. Tau thus equals d dt r cross p minus dr dt cross p. I can reduce these two terms on the right. dr dt is the change in position over time, and that equates to velocity. The momentum p is the mass times velocity, I end up with v cross mv, and the cross product of a vector with itself is zero, so this is equal to zero. That leaves me with this, tau equals d dt r of r cross p. Tau is now expressed as a derivative, d dt of r cross p. The formula for tau resembles this. The equation for force based on Newton's, this is the equation for force based on Newton's second law. The equation for tau is a rotational version of force, and r cross p is a rotational form of momentum. I'll define L as the rotational form of momentum, and we call this angular momentum. L equals r cross p. Torque or tau thus equals the change in angular momentum over time. And thus torque, torque equals the derivative of L, d dt of L. I, I now have a derivative form um, of tau that mimics the derivative form of f. And this is what torque and angular momentum look like. So while there's a force applied, there's torque. And while you apply that force, angular momentum increases. In part 18, I talked about uniform circular motion. For an object traveling in uniform circular motion, the velocity is tangent to the path of motion. Velocity is a measure of distance over time and has a directional component. I introduce omega as the rotational speed. It's a measure of the number of radians an object sweeps through per second. For uniform circular motion, omega is equal to 1, 2 pi revolution over the period. This makes intuitive sense since the period is the amount of time it takes to make one full revolution. In part 18, I did a derivation that resulted in speed being equal to r times omega. This is the magnitude of the velocity. And magnitude of velocity is not the same as the velocity vector. Velocity as a vector is defined by this equation. 
This obviously has the magnitude of r times omega, so the vector doesn't get longer, but with uniform circular motion, the direction of the velocity vector is always changing. Here's the equation for the position, position P. Acceleration equals r times omega squared. I also derived this in part 18. That's this vector here. This is the vector form of the equation. Acceleration always points toward the center of the circle. It's what Newton referred to as centripetal. With uniform circular motion, there's no angular acceleration, hence no torque. Now I want to introduce torque into these dynamics. I'll get rid of the velocity vector on the diagram and we'll introduce an angular force. This force, like velocity, will always be orthogonal to the position vector and will always be tangential to the path. With uniform circular motion, the resultant velocity was orthogonal to position and tangential to the path. This is somewhat different. It's a force I'm imparting on the object and I'm defining it to be orthogonal to the path, so I'll get a torque. Like I said before, if the force is not orthogonal, it would not create a torque. We know from Newton's second law that force equals mass times acceleration. That implies that acceleration equals force divided by mass. I showed you before that torque equals force times r times sine theta. In this case, the force will always be orthogonal, so theta will equal pi over two radians or 90 degrees. The equation for tau simplifies this. You might think intuitively that we can substitute ma for the force f. However, a is linear acceleration and we're dealing with rotation here. Plus, I already used a for the centripetal acceleration. The acceleration term needs to be the tangential acceleration, and here's how I'll derive that. Let me introduce the term alpha, which I'll call the change in angular velocity over time. And that's approximately equal to a final omega minus the initial omega over a time delta t. If you take the limit as delta t approaches zero, this becomes an equality. If I multiply both sides of this equation by r, that equates to a final velocity minus initial velocity over delta time. These velocities are scalar, so they're really speeds and are non-directional. A velocity vector takes into account direction, and these are non-directional. Change of velocity is acceleration. This is known as the tangential acceleration. And acceleration can be expressed with this symbology. This is the, known as the perpendicular component of acceleration. If I substitute our alpha for the tangential, tangential acceleration, I get tau equals r m r alpha, which equates to m r squared alpha. Angular acceleration thus equals tau over m times r squared. m r squared is known as the moment of inertia. It's the rotational equivalent of mass. Hence, this equation can be expressed as tau over i, the moment of inertia. You'll recall that momentum p is mass times velocity. Angular momentum l is the moment of inertia times rotational velocity. If v equals r omega, then omega equals v over r. This can be expressed as mr squared v over r, which reduces to rmv, and that, of course, can be reduced to r times p. So I want to set this up in vPython. And I'm running this in Pyzo, so I have access to the command line. I'm going to bring in the vPython library with this statement. And then here I'm just setting up the canvas that I'm going to depict all this stuff in. And I want an x, y, and z set of vectors so I can know what the axes are. That's just for display purposes. So I'm going to set r equal to 50, call it 50 meters. And I'm going to define a sphere this way with the sphere object, and this is actually wrong. All right, so if I run this the correct way, I have the x, y, and z axis and a sphere 50 meters away from the origin. Now, here I'm setting up the rotational speed, omega, and I'll set it to 0 0.01, so one hundredth of a radian per second of rotational speed. And then I'm going to set the object's mass to 50. And in Python, I can just create a variable m that's a property of object and refer to that as object.m. So as I showed you before, the 
Scalar velocity is r times omega. The scalar acceleration is r times omega squared. And if I execute this, if I go over to the command line, I can show you the value of v scalar is 0.5, and the value of a scalar is 0.005. All right, so I really want to depict velocity and acceleration as vectors. So there's the velocity vector, and I derived this in part 18 and showed you this on the previous slide. And here's the centripetal acceleration vector. Okay, those are vectors. I want to display them as arrows. And so um, I'm multiplying that by 25 so you can see the arrow. Otherwise, it gets really, really small. And I'll actually make that 10 later. I set it as 25 ar arbitrarily. And, and then here's the acceleration vector. All right, so that's the formula for the velocity vector. That's the formula for the acceleration vector that I derived on the previous slide. I actually derived in part 18, but I showed you on the previous slide. And then here's how the animation works. For time ranging from one to a thousand seconds, I'm going to speed this up at a rate of 50. And I will simply change the position of the object over time. And you can see I get nice uniform circular motion. And the formula for position I showed you on the previous slide as well. That's this formula here. And it's a function of omega t. So if I set the angular speed omega and have t go from 1 to 1,000, the position changes over time. All right, now I want to compute the uh, velocity vector. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move the arrow to the sphere position so it travels with the sphere. And then the vector is a function of omega t for this formula. And then I'm going to multiply the vector times 10 so you can see it. Otherwise, it gets really small. And there's a nice velocity vector that travels with the sphere. And I want to do something similar for the acceleration vector and the acceleration arrow. All right, so the acceleration arrow is going to travel with the sphere. And then this recomputes the acceleration vector as a function of omega t with the formula I showed you on the previous slide. And then I'll multiply this by 1,000, otherwise it gets really tiny. And I actually don't need these factors. In these statements, I'm, actually, I'm just setting up the initial variables so I can use them in the for loop. And if I run this, I get uniform circular motion with a tangential velocity vector and a centripetal acceleration vector. Okay, so I haven't dealt with torque yet. This is just setting up the basic animation so I can show you torque and angular momentum. All right, and I showed you vscalar before. It's not using the animation, but it's 0.5. There's the velocity vector, and I can actually compute the magnitude of v, which is 0.5. A scalar is 0.05. There's the a vector, and there's the magnitude of a, and they match. Okay, so continuing on, I want to add um, an angular momentum vector. And so first I'm computing momentum. It's just the mass times velocity. And then the momentum vector is the velocity vector times the object's mass. And then here's a momentum arrow. And I can add that to the animation here. 
So the momentum arrow is going to travel with the sphere by modifying the position in that statement. And that's the momentum vector, which I'll recompute with every iteration because the velocity vector is changing. So I don't need the trigonometric formula. I can use the velocity vector. And then this one I have to divide by 5 to make it smaller. And now you get a momentum vector that is superimposed on top of the velocity vector. Okay, now this is the moment of inertia, the mass times the uh, distance r squared. And then this is the angular momentum, r times m times, and that's the scalar form. But the vector form is the position vector cross the momentum vector. And you can see in vPython, that's a very simple computation. I didn't have to do a lot of complex math to derive angular momentum, L. And now I want to display the angular momentum arrow. So I, oh, first of all, I recompute the angular momentum vector because P is changing. And then I want to get rid of this um, z-axis because angular momentum is going to be superimposed on the z-axis. And there's the angular momentum vector. And you can see for uniform circular motion, angular momentum is constant. Or with uniform circular motion, there's a conservation of angular momentum. All right, so that's what angular momentum looks like. And again, there's no torque in this motion. So that's why the vector is uniform. So now I want to introduce a torque. And to do that, um, first of all, the, the centripetal force is F equals MA. And this is how you display a force arrow. It also superimposed on the acceleration vector. And for each iteration, because the acceleration vector changes, I'll change the centripetal force vector. And then I'll change the uh, length of the vector. And then I want to hide that arrow um, because the force is going to be superimposed on acceleration. And I need to I made a mistake. I need to hide that as well. All right, now if I run this, or comment that out, not hide it. And you can't see the force vector, it's too small, so I need to multiply that by some factor. So I'll choose 50. And now we get a force vector. So there's a momentum vector and a force vector. And angular momentum is the yellow vector. This co with the z-axis. 
and if I show you, if I, that's the force vector, there's the force magnitude. And then there's the um, mo uh, moment of inertia, angular momentum scalar, angular momentum vector, and angular momentum magnitude, which is pretty simple because it's only along the z-axis. All right, this is torque. It's the position across the force, centripetal force. And that's the only force acting on this body. So for now, that's what torque is equal to. And there's a torque arrow. And I actually want to change this to a tangential force because, again, a centripetal force would create no torque. So you get zero. And F tangential. I'm going to set to 0, 0.0. So no torque in this animation. All right, the torque is the cross product of the position vector and the uh, tangential force. And this is actually the tangential force uh, unit vector. If I multiply, I'm sorry, this is the tangential force and I'm using the V unit vector to uh, set the direction. And that just means I can avoid a lot of messy trigonometry. Now I want to hide the angular acceleration because torque is um, co-aligned with uh, Angular velocity. I'm sorry, did I say angular? And I've got another mistake. All right, that needs to be multiplied by v hat. So it's tangential force co with the velocity vector. So it's orthogonal to the position vector. And now, if you, if I zoom in, you can see the torque is zero. The vector's there, but it's zero. There's no arrow because it has zero length, which would be the case for uniform circular motion. There is no torque. And F tangential equals zero. So I now want to introduce a, a, um, an omega that changes over time. And I'm just going to add F tangential every time increment. And now I'll create an F tangential force that's 0 0.0001. So it's not equal to 0. And now if I run this animation, this is no longer uniform circular motion you can see that the object is spinning faster and faster and faster. Now, the centripetal force keeps increasing. You have to do that in order to maintain uniform circular motion. And then that yellow vector is the torque vector. And you can see there's constant torque. So there's constant torque. There's a constant tangential force. But there's an accelerating uh, rotational velocity which makes intuitive sense. If I keep applying a force, I'm going to continue to increase the uh, tangential velocity and the, and the rate of rotation. All right, so torque was constant in that animation. Now if I display angular momentum and hide torque, And I need to comment that out as well. 
Okay, so the rotational speed is increasing. And, oh, I made a mistake there. All right, I'm recomputing the angular momentum with each iteration. And now when I run this, all right, watch the angular momentum vector, it keeps increasing. So as the rotational speed increases, the angular momentum increases, the centripetal force has to increase. Centripetal force is the string that the ball's on. At some point, the string would break. All right, so torque is constant, constant force, but angular momentum increases over time. And that should give you some feel for how the dynamics of this work. And I can display that um, tangential force as a vector. And I'll keep the velocity vector arrow commented out because and I'll go back to displaying torque and not angular momentum. Okay, so that magenta vector is the tangential force. So that's going to be a thruster. It's going to be some impetus that is orthogonal to the position as this rotates that'll create that force and that'll cause the rotation. And there's the magnitude of the force, which is what I set um, in the code. And those two values are actually equal. When a system consists of multiple parts, the individual bodies composing it will generally be subject to both internal and external torques. For the system as a whole, however, the internal torques would cancel if there are no external torques. When I talked about forces in the end body problem, all the internal forces canceled. I'm going to show you here that the internal torques cancel as well. Internal torques are equal and opposite and act along the line joining the two bodies as two gravitational forces. And I'll prove that formally. So consider a pair of bodies defined by position vectors R1 and R2. And let's assume that there's an attractive force between them. F12 is the force exerted by body 1 and body 2, and it acts along the line between body 1 and 2. F21 is the force exerted by body 2 on body 1, and acts on the same line between the two bodies. And here's the origin that defines the axis of rotation. The torque experienced by body 1 is um, tau 2 1 and is R1 cross F1. The torque experienced by body 2 is tau 1 2 and is R2 cross F1 2. And you recall um, when I discussed torque that the only force along the perpendicular component of the position vector generates a, a torque. Only the force along the perpendicular component generates a torque. This line segment is along the line between the two bodies, the line along which the forces are applied. And this line segment is perpendicular to the line segment and the line between the two bodies. A force applied orthogonal to this line creates a torque. The component of the R vector that's parallel to the force does not contribute to a torque. A force that's parallel creates a change in velocity. Thus, this line segment is the perpendicular component of both R1 and R2.
The torque tau 1, 2 is thus equal to the per perpendicular component of R2 cross F1, 2. Likewise, the torque tau 2, 1 is equal to the perpendicular component of R1 cross F2, 1. Newton's third law states that F2, 1 must equal minus F1, 2. If the perpendicular of R1 equals the perpendicular of R2, then F1, 2 and F2, 1 are collinear. The net internal torque of the pair is thus zero. The sum of the two torques, T1, 2, 1 plus T1, 2, is the perpendicular of R1, which equals the perpendicular of R2 cross F2, 1 plus F1, 2. This is true about any point. We can extend this to show that the sum of all internal torques vanishes. The only torque that can result in rotation is an external torque. Tau EXT only contributes to DL for a system of particles. When an external force is present, integration over time yields the integral from T1 to T2 of TXT, which equals the angular momentum L at T2 minus the angular momentum L at T1. So I want to go back to the n-body problem I talked about in part 22 and now talk about torque. I said that torque is the cross product of the position vector R and the force vector F. That equates to R cross MA or MR cross A, which equates to MR cross R double dot. Recall that the cross product results in a normal vector. This notation represents that as an arrow pointing straight at you. The normal vector for R cross F would be orthogonal to both both R and F, and it can only point straight out of the screen. The torque on mass one is M1 R1 cross R1 double dot. And I'll go back to this equation and express it with respect to M1. M1 R1 double dot equals G M1 M2 over R12 cubed times R12. The M1s cancel, and I can now express M1 R1 cross R1 double dot as M1 R1 cross GM2 over R12 cubed times R12. That equals GM1 M2 over R cubed times R1 cross R12. Next, I'll reduce R1 cross R12. Recall that R12 equals R2 minus R1. R1 cross R12 thus equals R1 cross R2 minus R2. And that equals R1 cross R2 minus R1 cross R1. R1 cross R1 is zero, so this equals R1 cross R2. That reduces the tor torque on R1. Next, I'll need to reduce the torque on R2. That's R2, R21. From that, I get R2 cross R1 minus R2 cross R2, and that results in R2 cross R1. And when I say reduce the torque, I don't mean reduce the actual torque. I mean reduce the equation for torque. If I reduce those, it's minus R1 cross R2. If I add those two together, I discover that the sum of the torques is zero. And this makes sense. Since there's no external, external forces acting on this two-body system, the total torque, net torque, must be zero. Here's another way to express that. That goes back to the original equation for torque, M1 R1 cross R1 double dot plus M2 R2 cross R2 double dot. If I take the integral of that function, I get M1 R1 cross R1 dot plus M2 R2 cross R2 dot. And because I'm integrating a function that equals zero, the result is a constant, which I'll call L sub zero. This integrated function is the angular momentum of the system, and this indicates it's constant. That has to be the case since there are no external torques acting on the system. This two-body system is a system that rotates with constant and angular momentum. It's not just constant magnitude, it's constant in direction. Because it's orthogonal to R, this implies that all the position vectors of M1 or M2 must lie in a plane. That conforms to um, part of Kepler's first law that planets orbit the sun in ellipses that are in a plane. You recall from part 18 on Galilean and Newtonian physics that angular speed is R times omega. And you recall from part 22 that momentum P equals mass times linear velocity. Angular momentum is just um, is thus R times mass M times the perpendicular component of velocity. I want to consider the case of a central force, um, and I'll express it this way. The magnitude of the force is F of R, and the inner vector R indicates it has a radial direction toward the center. This is how gravitational forces work. A central force exerts a torque about almost all points, but if the reference is placed at the force center,
then R is always parallel to the force, and so torque tau is R cross F. Substituting F of R times the unit vector R, I get the tau equals R cross F of R times the unit vector R. The vector R equals the magnitude of R times the unit vector R, so I can make that substitution. The cross product of a vector with itself is zero, hence this whole equation is zero. The angular momentum around a central force is conserved. Likewise, R cross P, which equals R cross MV, is a constant. This holds for uniform circular motion. In fact, it explains why circular motion is uniform. It also holds for elliptical orbits that swing inward and outward with a velocity V, speeding up and slowing down as the body travels through apoapsis and periapsis. So I want to go back to Kepler and review his second law of orbital motion. Orbital Imagine a vector at some time t, r, drawn from the sun to a planet. If the planet moves through a displacement, delta r, in some short time, delta t, then its new position is r plus delta r. The three vectors of r, delta r, and r plus delta r form a triangle. The area of this triangle, delta a, is one half the base times the height delta r sine theta, where theta is the angle between r and delta r. This suggests using the vector cross product to represent the area. The cross product between two vectors is equal to the area of the parallelogram form of the vectors. The area of the triangle is half the area of the parallelogram. In vector notation, I write the area of the triangle as delta a equals one half the magnitude of r cross delta r. The direction of the cross product given by the right-hand rule is perpendicular to the plane of the vectors. So I can introduce the vector delta A equals one half R cross delta R and call it the area vector delta A. Its length is the area of the triangle formed by R and delta R. The rate of change of this area vector dA dt is the limit as the time interval delta t goes to zero of delta A divided by delta t. That equals the limit as delta t approaches zero of one half R cross delta R over delta t. I can separate the cross product into two limits. The first limit, 1 half r over delta t always equals r because r doesn't vary with delta t. The equation simplifies to this, 1 half r cross the limit as delta t approaches zero of delta t over delta r over delta t. Limit as t approaches zero of delta r over delta t is a derivative of dr dt and dr dt is a velocity. The equation becomes 1 half r cross v, d dt equals 1 half r cross v, and the connection to Newton's dynamics becomes clear. And I said that R doesn't vary over time. That's true for uniform circular motion, not for elliptical orbits. L, the angular momentum equals R cross P, the momentum. Momentum P equals M, the mass, times V, the velocity. I can substitute MV for P. And the way the multiplication of scalars work with cross products is if one of them is multiplied by a scalar, I can factor it out. Hence, R cross MV equals M times R cross V. L over M thus equals R cross V. I can make that substitution in the equation for um, dA dt. dA dt equals 1 half L over M. And that simplifies to L over 2M. The mass M is constant and 2 is obviously constant. Hence, L, the angular momentum, must be constant. From Newton's second law, um, we know that angular momentum must be conserved. And when there's a central force, um, L is constant in magnitude and direction. That means that dA dt is also constant, which confirms Kepler's second law. The fact that L has constant direction also implies Kepler's first law, which states that the path of the orbits of the planets is an ellipse and lies in a plane. Since L divided by M is the cross product of R and V, each of R and V must be perpendicular to L. L is constant, so has no constant so as constant direction, that implies that both R and V must lie in a perpendicular plane to the direction of L. Conservation of angular momentum implies a planar orbit. So that's how we relate conservation of angular momentum to Kepler's second law. Okay, here I wanna go back to an animation I did, um, which was a three body problem and I called the three bodies I'm sorry, I'm gonna do um, an animation I did for the planets. And I'm gonna change this radius scale factor. Um, I set that scale factor so you can see the vectors um, 
in the inner planets or the vectors with the outer planets. And now I want to add angular momentum vectors for the Sun, for Mercury, for Venus, Earth. And I'm setting these vectors as zero just so I can set up the variables. There's Mars. There's Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune. And now I need to reintroduce the center of mass. As I mentioned in the previous part, when I showed you this animation, the sun's at the center of mass the sun revolves around the center of mass of the solar system. So I reintroduce the center of mass, so I have a reference location to draw the angular momentum. And here I recompute angular momentum as you go through each inter integration. It's the position across the uh, momentum. And then I'm going to reposition the arrow um, based on the position of the center of mass. And then down here, I'm recomputing the uh, position for the center of mass. And then this is the angular momentum for the entire solar system, which is a summation of all the angular momentums of the planets. And then this is the angular momentum vector. Or the, I'm sorry, the arrow that I want to display in the animation. And then I'm going to put a label above the angular momentum vector. Um, in this animation, you can't really see the vector moving. And I'll show you in some cases it does indeed move. In others, it doesn't. So I'm going to show you the vector coordinates to several decimal places. Okay, so if I run this animation, I've got planets orbiting. And you can see that for the solar system, there's a conservation of angular momentum. Now, in order to accomplish that, the sun has to move. The sun's not a fixed point in the solar system. But given no external torques, there is no change in the angular momentum of the solar system. And the arrows were a little big for my taste, so I'm, I'm going to make them smaller. The vector arrows. All right, so those are a little easier to see. And there's the angular momentum vector pointing out of the sun normal to the plane of rotation. And again, in the solar system, there's not one single plane of rotation. So it's the, the aggregate plane of rotation. Okay, so now I'd like to show the angular momentum for Jupiter, the most massive planet in the solar system. And then I won't do angular momentum for the um, entire solar system. So this is just Jupiter. Okay, you can't see the angular momentum vector arrow move, but if you look at the values of the x, y, and z coordinates of the head of the vector, it's changing. So for Jupiter within the solar system, there's not a conservation of angular momentum. There would be, actually there wouldn't even be if there was a single sun and a Jupiter. There's only conservation of angular momentum for the entire solar system.
Okay, here I'm going to show the Earth. And this is a problem I have with Python. There. And you can see its angular momentum vector is changing much more significantly. And again, you can't see it move, but you can see from the coordinates I'm displaying that it's changing as things move in the solar system. So for the Earth orbit, there are torques that are causing the angular momentum to change. That's why the period of the orbit changes over time and different orbital parameters change over time. And here I'll show you Mercury. Doesn't change as much as the, as the Earth. There's probably a good reason for that. It's a small planet, pretty close to the sun. But nonetheless, there are changes in the angular momentum of the Mercury, of Mercury in its orbit. Here I want to show you the three-body system, and I call these Earth, Venus, Mars arbitrarily. Um, these are more rational motions, and so I'm adding angular momentum vectors for the three bodies, and an angular momentum vector for the center of mass, which is an arbitrary point at the center of mass of the system. And here I recompute center of mass in the... Uh, time-based loop. And here I compute the center of mass by adding, I'm sorry, I compute the um, angular momentum by adding all the angular momentums of all the planets. And then I'll display an arrow to depict the angular momentum vector in the animation. Okay, so this isn't even close to elliptical motion. But you can see there's a conservation of angular momentum, even with all these eccentric motions going on. And if you recall, when I showed you this animation for the first time, the center of mass is moving at a constant velocity. But there is no um, net torque on this system. So the angular momentum is constant. Now what I want to show you is the angular momentum for one of the bodies. And I'll pick Earth in this case. And then I want to hide the angular momentum for the system, the three-body system. And this is another Python issue. There. It's not only increasing, but it's changing direction. So the, the plane of quote unquote rotation for this Earth is changing in this animation. In fact, that blue object is not rotating in a plane. And the magnitude of angular momentum, it, it goes in and out of the sphere, but it's changing significantly. And then it just coalesced with the uh, cyan planet. So for a single body in a three-body system like this, there is not a conservation of angular momentum. There's torques induced by the other bodies. Okay, I want to look at a special case where an orbiting planet is in an elliptical orbit at aphelion and perihelion. Um, I know that dA dt is constant per Kepler's second law and it equals one half r cross v. At perihelion, theta is zero radians. At aphelion, theta is pi radians. r cross v equals the scalar r times the scalar v times the sine of theta. 
the sine of zero equals one and the sine of pi equals one. And so in this special case, r cross b equals r times b along the normal unit vector. For aphelion and perihelion, one half rp times bp equals one half ra times va. And if I know the speed of perihelion and recall the speed is the magnitude of the velocity vector, I can solve for the speed at aphelion. V sub a equals V sub p times rp over ra. Perihelion for the Earth is 1.4 times 10 to the eighth kilometers. Aphelion is 1.2 times 10 to the eighth kilometers. The speed of perihelion is 30.2 kilometers per second. And if I plug in values, I get VA equals 30.2 times 1.47 divided by 1.52, which equals 29.2 kilometers per second. And this only works at perihelion and aphelion, or um, more generally, periapsis and apoapsis. The main takeaways from this part, um, I want to show you the, the terms and the quantities for rotational and translational motion. Translational displacement is expressed as a scalar value r, and rotation is expressed as an angle theta. Translational speed is expressed as a velocity and is the change in displacement over time. Rotational velocity is expressed as omega and is the change in angle over time. Translational acceleration is the change in velocity over time. Rotational acceleration is the change in rotational velocity omega over time. Translational force is f. Rotational force is torque, tau, and is the cross product of um, R and F. Translational momentum is mass times velocity. Angular momentum is R cross P, or R cross M times V. Newton's second law implies that force equals mass times acceleration and can be expressed as a change in momentum over change in time. For rotational dynamics, Newton's second law applies that torque equals the change in angular momentum over time.